All right, I think it's about time we get this thing started now, don't we? I'm only one minute late. I'm supposed to start at 10, 10.01. I'm still good. I do start the stream a little bit early, though, just, you know, get a little bit of lead time, get, give people time to, to, uh, to kind of filter in. But that also gives me a chance to make sure that everything is ready to go. I think it is. We can get rid of this now. I think I'm starting to see the appreciation of a stream deck. Can't afford one of those, but maybe someday. Someday when I'm successful. Maybe. I did pick up three subscribers yesterday, so I'm well on my way. According to my current count, I'm sitting at 233. So that's, um... That's, uh... 777, I think? Until I will officially call myself a success. Because that's the goal. Gotta get to 1,000. Anyway, though, let's get into this. So, hello, everybody who's here. Or everybody who's watching afterwards. Shadowcat's back, and we're doing another lecture. Today's lecture may be a little bit on the shorter side, just because I don't think it's a terribly complicated topic. But, we're going to be talking about evil. And I promise this is not going to be an entire lecture on Dungeons & Dragons. I, I promise, okay? Scout's honor. I haven't been a scout in years, but... It's there. I mean, I could go on a tangent, but... It, it'll be a short tangent. And honestly, it'll probably be covered up, or covered by what we're talking about today anyway. So, today... I want to discuss evil, and the reason I want to is because it is a word that we hear thrown around over and over and over again these days. This person is evil. That group is evil. They're evil. We're evil. Everything. It, it's one of those words that gets thrown around so much that once upon a time, it was a, a significant accusation to levy at somebody. Kind of like calling them a Nazi. Nowadays, you can call somebody evil, and they're just like, meh. Whatever. It's lost all meaning. And the reason why it's lost all meaning is because, well, it's lost all meaning. Everything now is labeled evil. Every person now is labeled evil. And if everyone is, a, is something, then nobody is. Go ahead and cue the, the, the Megamind clip here. If everybody's super, no one is super, right? Well, if everybody's evil, then nobody's evil. So today, we're going to discuss what it is, what it means. I, one of the things I probably should have pulled up was like a, a dictionary definition. Hold on, let me, let me get that real quick. Let me go ahead and get that real quick. So we can have that too. We'll, we'll start with a dictionary definition here, like, like we used to do. So, um, let's just go to dictionary.com. Why not? So there we go. We're going to cover, or we're going to start with the definition, and then we're going to go through some classic examples of it. Then I want to talk about how it's been kind of permeating through society with one particularly, um, particularly nuanced example that I have, at least in my life. And then I want to get into a discussion of where it is in the world. How do we see it? How do we identify it? Now, unfortunately, I can't really get into how we deal with it because I don't have those answers. I can't even really offer suggestions because there is no one answer. I, the one answer is going to be kind of similar to when we discussed um, the seven deadly sins the other day. What was that video? I don't remember. Either way, uh, you, there is no one solution for that besides, you know, constant vigilance and conscientiousness. That, that's really it. So, this is not going to be a solutions video. This is going to be simply... This isn't even really a, com a complaining video, okay? This isn't a rant. This is just, I want to give you a tool that you can use in your life. A lens to look through to see the world in a different way. Which is, generally speaking, what most of my, my lectures tend to be. 
I want to give you a tool to help change your life. And by changing your life, you change your household, you change your community, you change your culture, you can change the world. That's my goal here. So, without further ado... Yeah, I'm definitely starting to see the... Uh, the advantages of having a stream deck, because I think that most of these things could be automated with a button. Um, there we go. Okay, so here's where we're going to start. I want to start with just a simple definition. And according to dictionary.com, I'm not sure where they get their sources, but it, it works. So... Dictionary.com has several examples here. We have an adjective definition, a noun, a verb, well, adverb. I want to go to the noun because I just want to determine what is the thing. And this is great because the first definition under noun is that, wi or that which is evil, which is a circular definition, but evil quality, intention, or conduct. And it's those last three that I really want to focus on, particularly the last two of the three, the intention and the conduct, because intention and conduct will result in quality. The second one is a force of nature that governs and gives rise to wickedness and sin. That's kind of the same. That one's a little bit more subjective because now we're getting into kind of religious territory, and I, I understand that... The concept of good and evil is going to be extremely subjective. Uh, extremely so. However, even though good and evil are going to be inherently subjective, I intend to blur the line today between subjectivity and objectivity because while good and evil may be subjective takes, as I'm going to show you, if we all have the same subjective view, then is it really subjective anymore? It's, it's um, somewhat similar to an anime that many people out there may be familiar with called Ghost in the Shell. What the show is, is not important. What is important, though, is that the main focus in the first season of the show is a case that they're trying to solve. It's a mystery. The hardest part of the mystery, though, is that part of finding the person responsible would require you to find evidence to prove that this person was responsible. But they can't find it. Because every time a case shows up that looks similar to his work, it's always done by a different person. And so they actually coined the term standalone complex, the meaning of which is unaffiliated, unknowing people who are all acting to a similar cause without concert. It's a whole bunch of people who are working to the same end without communicating, coordinating, anything. And that's what I believe we have going on here. Every single person has a general subjective take on what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is evil. Societies in culture form when we more or less agree on what is good and what is evil. And I'll give you a very simple example. Murder. Now, I know that some people can immediately jump to different cultures around the world who have much more lenient takes on killing. They might have legal takes on that, or they might have some kind of religious jurisdiction on what can and cannot be killed. But in general, if you were to ask the average person around the world, is it right to kill somebody, not an enemy, not somebody who is wronging you in some way, not a thief, not, not a, an abuser, not anything, just any random person on the sidewalk, most people would say no. It, it is wrong to kill people. And this, this is common everywhere in the world. 
the fact that you have to try and find nuance, you have to try and find a justification, an excuse, tells you everything you need to know. Is it wrong? Yes. Unless. Is it wrong? Yes. But. We all acknowledge that yes, it is wrong. And you have to find some reason to not make it wrong. Something to, to justify it in your own mind. And this is something that we see a lot. So if you go around the world and everyone agrees on this, then can we say that objectively, since we all agree, objectively, is just wanton murder wrong? I think we can all agree on that. Therefore, we can go through and we can say that not only is this an objective truth, I think we th that we can all agree that this would be an objective evil. Again, this is going to be a, a kind of a nuanced discussion, so strap in and and you know don't don't get uh, don't get too uptight. So now that we've got our definition, I want to talk about a couple of other things. First thing is this. I want to go into demonology. And why is that? Well, because demonology is, well, demons are regarded as evil creatures. And so I did a little bit of research, not a lot of research. I'm, I'm no scholar of any kind. But I wanted to see around the world what different cultures thought about demons of sorts. So right here, I have Christian demonology. We're going to start here, but trust me, we're not going to end here. So in Christian demonology, you can see it highlighted right here. We have the same characteristics as good angel counterparts. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, they are not omniscient. Each one has a specific knowledge, sometimes on more than one subject. More importantly, though, uh, let's see, where was it? It's hard for me to read this, but I know I read it before. Um... So, two conclusions to be reached. Um, right, here, second paragraph. So, Christian demonology states that the mission of demons is to induce humans to sin. That is to say that a demon could not take your hand and force you into doing something. And that's important, as we're going to discuss later. It's their job to come down and to whisper to you, to haunt you, to pester you, to generally badger you into doing something that you w might not otherwise do. And hello, Jeffrey. Good to have you in the chat. So in this case, they say demons are believed to tempt people into abandoning the faith, to commit heresy or apostasy. Uh, if I'm remembering right, um, heresy is actions that have been committed against the faith. Apostasy is simply ceasing to follow the faith, if I remember. And blasphemy is speaking against the faith. I think I've got that right. It's also believed that they may torment people through life or through demonic possession. Demonic possession we're not going to get into because that would actually be literally guiding your hand. And by the way, if you are a follower of Christianity and you speak about things like possession, people who are possessed cannot be found guilty of sin because it wasn't them doing it. It's that simple. Now, they can still cause harm, obviously, because it is a demon acting through them, but they're never guilty of sin. A person who was possessed and died during possession would technically still be considered innocent. That's why demons don't usually possess people. The idea is that they try to get you to do it yourself. There's a reason for that. And Jeffrey says, how are you? I'm doing fine. I hope you brought your helmet because we're going in deep on this one. So this is Christian demonology. However, we're not done yet. I also went over to Judaism. Now, in Judaism, I found this. And Judaism doesn't really have demons as such. It has something called the Shedim, I think. 
I think I'm pronouncing that right. I don't speak Hebrew, obviously. Hebrew looks like it's a very tough language. I can barely grasp the basics of Japanese. Uh, so, Shedim are spirits, or sometimes demon, in, um, in Jewish mythology, but they do not exactly correspond with the concept of demons as evil entities. These evil spirits were thought to cause maladies differing conceptually from the Shedim, who were, in fact, not evil demigods, but the gods of foreigners. They're not necessarily evil, they're only inherent evil, inherently evil because they are not of God. And in this sense, Shedim don't try to tempt people into doing, they just have like an aura around them that causes bad things to happen. So, essentially, and this may be a, this may be a very simplistic definition, but it's the best I can do with my limited knowledge. Being Shadim, being not of the faith, is simply bad, and you will cause bad things to happen around you because you are a foreign object. Think of it like getting a splinter. What happens when you get a splinter? Well, maybe you get an infection, and Shadim are considered like an infection in your community. And it's an infection that can get worse unless you deal with it. Not inherently evil, but still malignant. Let's move on a little bit. So, now that we've covered Judaism, let's go move on or move over to Islam. Now, Islam is actually very, very similar to Christianity. Their demons are called the Shaitan, I think. Shaitan? Shaitan? I'm not sure. I don't speak Hebrew. I don't speak Arabic either. Arabic also looks really, really hard. Uh, let's see. I can't really read it very well. But these are also similar to demons, evil spirits, which don't necessarily do things but what they do is they try to entice you to do things. It says here, inciting humans and the jinn, not sure what a jinn is, but to sin by whispering in their hearts. Basically, they are those little demons in, or those little voices inside your head that says, just do it. Nobody has to know. Uh, they're mentioned in several places. We're not going to go through the whole thing, but the point is that these are evil spirits which will tempt you to sin. And as we've discussed before, when it comes to your Abrahamic religions, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam, your sins are basically the same. And we'll get to that later. We already covered it before. We covered the seven deadly sins, and you'll find those also in Judaism and Islam. There's some nuances, some differences between them, but in general, they all follow the same guidelines. And, you know, primarily for reasons that we've already discussed. There is a reason why they're deadly and a reason why they are to be avoided. We're not going to rehash it. If you are more interested in that and haven't seen it before, go watch the other video. It's very long, but it's very good. Next, we're going to jump to something different. So these are the Abrahamic religions. But what about other places? I decided to look up Shintoism. Now, Shintoism doesn't have gods in the same way? Like, your Abrahamic religions have God in all of its various names, and God is the three big O's. He is omniscient, he has, or he is omnipresent, and he is omnipotent. He is everywhere, knows everything, and can do anything. Shintoism doesn't have that. Shintoism does have higher deities, but they're not regarded as being omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. They're, they're much more grounded than that, and there's many more of them, for, I guess, obvious reasons. But when we jump over to Shintoism, we have the yokai. Now, yokai is kind of a generic term, and it doesn't necessarily mean bad. Yokai is basically just a spirit, although I think spirit is a different word. Again, my Japanese, very poor. I don't even know what the word for spirit would be. But yokai are essentially just spirits, and there's different types of yokai. Some of them are bad, some of them are good, some of them just 
are. However, there is one thing that all of Shintoism agrees is bad, and that would be the Oni. No, we're not talking about the video game. So an Oni is a kind of yokai. It is a demon, orc, ogre, or troll in Japanese folklore. They are mostly known for their fierce and evil nature, manifested in their propensity for murder and cannibalism. So notwithstanding their evil reputation, they uh, possess complex aspects that cannot be brushed away as simply evil. Yeah, I mean, they can be maybe excused sometimes. However, murder and cannibalism. <laughs> Stereotypically, they are conceived as red, blue, black, yellow, and white-colored, wearing loincloths of tiger pelt, carrying an iron kanabo, which is a Japanese-studded club. Uh, they are creatures which instill fear and feelings of danger due to their grotesque outward appearance, their wild and sometimes strange behavior and powers. Now, there are not... There are most yokai in... Shintoism and Japanese folklore are regarded as being balanced. You have to realize that most of these mythologies have a lot of bleed over, and so the idea of balance is present in almost everything. As they pointed here, you cannot simply brush away an, ona, an Oni as being simply evil. But they're definitely more evil than not. Hello, Flame. Good to see you. And so, when we have Oni, obviously murder and cannibalism, bad. I go back to the subject that I started, stated at the very beginning of this. We can all agree that killing people, generally bad. If we all agree on it, then... Then is it really... <laughs> is it really subjective anymore, or can we just call this an objective truth? Not going to linger here too much longer. I want to move on to now Hinduism. Now, Hinduism is a little bit differently because Hindus have a much different kind of philosophy here. It's a little bit philosophy, a little bit religion. They do still believe in God, which if my understanding of Hinduism is correct, that would be the Brahm, the Brahma, something like that. And then there are many other gods which are kind of underneath that. Uh, many of us are familiar with the name Shiva. Whether that's from games or stories or whatever, but Shiva is one of them. Uh, Krishnu, I believe, is also a Hindu god. Don't ask me what, they, what their special qualities are. I don't know. But the fact is that they have kind of like one over god and then uh, kind of lesser gods underneath there. I think. If anybody knows more about Hinduism, then please feel free to correct me, because I do kind of find it uh, uh, fascinating. However, while they don't have demons in Hinduism, they do have this thing called the Tamas. Now, right here, it says that the Tamas are roughly translated as darkness. It is one of the three gunas, which are tendencies, qualities, and attributes. So, it is a concept contrasted by the rajas, rahas, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, and the sattva. So, basically, you have darkness contrasted with passion and activity and purity and goodness. So, what is darkness? Well, while darkness is not exactly well-defined... It does give us a contrast. Darkness is not passionate. Darkness is not active. Darkness is not pure. Darkness is not good. Otherwise, it would be listed under these. So we have something that is dispassionate, lazy or slothful, impure or dirty, and just generally evil or harmful. You have the tamas. Now, part of Hinduism, they don't have demons, but they do believe that, as it says, this is part of your tendencies, qualities, and attributes. You have Thomas within you. Essentially, because they believe in karma, your actions 
affect your spirit. And while Islam, or not Islam, while Hinduism doesn't have demons, what Hinduism does have is you can have good and bad people. Hinduism does not shy away from just directly telling somebody, you are a bad person. As in, not just we believe or we think. No, Hinduism will come right out and say, you are a bad person. You are a blight upon the world and an abhorrence to God. And that's where the Thomas comes in. Somebody who has an excess of Thomas is generally regarded as what we would call a literal walking demon. And why? Well, look at what they would do. In most cultures, demons try to incite you to do bad things or they are directly harmful either to yourself or your community in some way. A person with a, an excessive Thomas would be harmful to their community. They would be slothful. They refuse to contribute. They, they would be dispassionate. They wouldn't care about anyone or anything. They would be dirty in all the words that you could really imagine that word to be in. And they would just be harmful. Whether that's physically harmful, whether that's spiritually harmful, they would be harmful to their community. So we can all agree that across these at least five examples that I've given, and there's more, I could... I try to think of major religions around the world, and really, I think I touched on most of the big ones. I, you have your three Abrahamic religions, Shintoism, Hinduism. I think those are like the biggest religions in the world. I didn't get into other mythologies. I considered going into Norse mythologies and things like that, because there is still a, a decent amount of following there. Maybe not to the same extent because we've moved past a lot of that, but Norse mythologies are still revered in the Norse countries. But I didn't really feel it was necessary. They have many of the same things. Um, Norse mythology, you have the spirits that inhabit Helheim, and if they get out, they wreak havoc. Um, I didn't want to cover things like, uh, like Wicca or witchcraft in those various forms, because a lot of that also kind of bleeds over a little bit into the Abrahamic religions. A lot of the demons that are that are involved in Wicca and witchcraft have bleed over or come from the Abrahamic mythologies. I didn't think it was necessary. But regardless, we have these common traits across all of these spiritualities. And why is that? The reason why is because regardless of where we are in the world, whether we were from Europe or from Africa or from Asia or from the Americas, we all have this common belief of what is generally good and what is generally evil. And our belief systems were built off of that, modeled off of that to represent that. As many people try to say, you know, un unfortunately, the person with that obnoxious coexist sticker on the back of their, their hybrid, they are kind of right. We, we are kind of all just, you know, one people with one belief. We just get caught up in the nuances between them. So if we all agree on what evil is, why is it we can't? seem to agree on what evil is. And the reason for that is because, well, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to, um, to really identify what is evil and what isn't evil. Which, you know, is why I'm here. That's what we're going to do today. And to get into that discussion, I'm going to bring up a person. I'm going to bring that person up right here. Some of you may know this person from YouTube. Some of you may not. He is one of the biggest YouTubers on YouTube right now, especially in the cultural political sphere. His name is Tim Pool. 
Tim Pool is a political, cultural podcaster. He used to be a reporter, but he's long since stopped doing that. I bring him up for a reason, though. I started following Tim Pool a long, long time ago when he was still using a GoPro out of his bedroom, when he was still doing groundwork, going to different places around the world. That's not really important, though. What is important is that over the last, I don't know, seven years or so, he has changed. And the reason why he has changed is because when he started... He was your typical, your typical liberal person. He didn't really believe that there were necessarily good or bad people. He believed that there were good people and misguided people. He, he was a firm believer that you, you don't just write a person off because they might have done a bad thing. I mean, after all, we have a criminal justice system because of that. Why is it that people have the presumption of innocence when they go to court? It's because we don't simply write a person off because of their actions. It's why Christianity tells you to turn the other cheek. It's why we always say people deserve a second chance. We never want to assume that a person is bad just because of what they've done. And that's why I want to bring up him, Tim Pool. Because, again, I've been watching him for like seven years now. And over those years, I have watched a transformation in him. It's a transformation that I've seen most notably in him, but not one that is unique to him. And that is, when he first started off, especially since he covers things like politics, he would go to places like, I believe one of his favorite topics would be Sweden. And he would go to Sweden, he would go to what were called the no-go zones. Places where you would have immigrants coming from either Africa or the Middle East, and they would end up setting up enclaves there, where they wouldn't really be allowed out of. Because they wouldn't be accepted by the larger society, they didn't speak the language, they couldn't get employment, and they ended up being shoved into these ghettos which then become enclaves, which then establish their own home culture there, which was drastically at odds to, you know, the, uh, the home country's culture, and it ended poorly. Not only did we see that in places like Sweden, we saw it in places like Britain, we saw it in Germany, France, Spain, we saw it in all of these places. And it really begged the question of, number one, why are the people being allowed in in the first place? Number two, why are they just kind of being shoved off here instead of being made to integrate? And number three, why is it that every time this happens, it seems like not only are they suffering, but it seems like it's being made for the home country's people to suffer? I, why is it that something will happen in, say, the Middle East... And then when the migrants are moving through all the other countries, rather than the countries being able to do anything to kind of integrate people, they're being told not to. Who's telling them to do it? Why aren't they being allowed to? Why is it that trying to enforce, say, an official language? Why, why is it you go to France and you, you need people to speak French? Why is it you're being told you're racist if you demand that people speak French in France. And for the longest time, people like him assumed that it's a stupid policy, this is probably the fault of bureaucracy, this is politicians who don't have any clue what's going on on the ground, they don't know what they're doing, they're dumb. And I'll admit, I was one of those people too for a long time. So it was him, it was me, it was a lot of people. However, any of us who have been paying even the slightest amount of attention to the way the socio-political uh, culture across the world has been changing in the last two years, the last six years, the last ten years, 
will acknowledge that things have not been getting better. As a matter of fact, they have been getting worse. And most of this has been, has been getting worse from the top down. It has been policies in, instituted by governments. It has been orders from international bodies. It has been all of these things telling people what they must do, what they must say, how they must live, and what they need to accept. A really, really great example would be all the COVID lockdowns. And while I'm not going to go into that extensively, because that is not the subject of this video, now that we're by and large out of them, almost every single government and almost every single organizational body across the world has agreed that the lockdowns were ineffective and that they did more harm than good, whether that was economic harm, social harm, physical harm, mental harm, add it all up, and the scales were wildly unbalanced. They did so much more harm than good. Now, when we look at that, of course, we would be tempted to say, well, I mean, it was a unique, a unique circumstance, and how are we to know? And that's a fair, that, that's a fair excuse. That's a fair excuse, and I'm, I'm going to take this off of here for a minute. That's because I don't want to look at, at that, you know, all day. It was a fair excuse for the first year. Because after a year, well, after a year, we had data. We had data on lethality rates. We had data on vaccine rates. We had economic data for a year. We had mental health and physical health data for a year. We had a year's worth of data that we could then pour over to say, is this working or is it not working? And this was a major turning point for a lot of people because a lot of people could look at the data and say, what we're being told and what's being shown were not the same thing. And yet... What was the message that we got in return? The message that we got in return was not only do we need to continue with what we're doing, we need more of it. And so it only got harsher and stricter from there. So why is it that we have seen this large shift from calling people naive or ignorant or just plain mistaken into evil. Where is that dividing line? And actually, there is a pretty easy and strict dividing line. And it's not just actions. This is actually something that I want to talk about the other day, and I forgot to go into it, but this is a perfect time to go into it now. And that is intention. Intention makes all the difference. The reason why, at least here in the U.S. and places like Canada, have the justice system that we do with the presumption of innocence is because when somebody does a thing, we try not to assume intention. Because it really makes all the difference. Intention is why we have the difference between manslaughter and murder. Hitting somebody with a car and killing them is manslaughter. Now, regardless of what happened, it's manslaughter. You did it. Did you mean to do it? Generally speaking, no, we don't mean to do these things. Maybe it was a car accident. Maybe, maybe you made a mistake, a deadly mistake, but generally speaking, we don't have intention. Intention, though, is where the entire game changes. Because if you hit somebody with a car and kill them because you saw them crossing a crosswalk and ran them over, we're no longer talking about an accident. 
we're no longer talking about a mistake. This was an intentional action. It is something that you chose to do. And this is where we get into the concept of evil. When we go back to the Christian demonology, what did the demons do? They didn't make you do things. They tempted you into doing things. Because it wasn't enough for the demon to do it. The demon can do it all day. The demon doesn't care. The demon needed to get you to do it. The same thing was true in Islamic, where you had the shaitan. I think it's shaitan. Where they would whisper to you and try to make you do things. The oni that I mentioned did wicked things, and they're, they're kind of universally regarded as evil. But there were other yokai, which would also haunt you, whisper to you, tempt you into doing things. And while the oni would be, you know, actively doing things, Hinduism had a different philosophy of Thomas where if you chose to do these things, every evil action that you took would add darkness to your spirit. And why is that? Well, because you would have to have a dark spirit to do these things in the first place, generally. You would have to be a dark person to actively harm your community in some way. And why do I say that? Well, I'm bringing this up again. We remember this. We saw this before. We're coming back to it now. So we're going to talk about intention today. And why is it that we have these sins here, and why is it that these send you to hell? I mean, pride. Let, let's just start with pride. I mean, is it possible to be accidentally prideful? Actually, it is. If you do something so well and so many times that you just kind of kind of forget about it, and, and you suddenly find yourself being prideful just thinking that you're better than people without you even realizing it, then, yeah, you, you are guilty of pride. Now, technically, that would be enough to send you to hell. But is it being done intentional? Might not be. Maybe you just didn't realize you were doing it. The real question here comes in, if somebody was to point it out to you, if somebody was to say that you are, you, you're, you're being a little prideful here, now you have a choice. Now you're at a fork in the road. Do you take the path of humility and say, I didn't realize what I was doing. I apologize for my behavior. I'm going to make the effort to be a better person. Or do you take the other path and say, well, no, I deserve it. I am better. I am better at what I'm doing than everybody else. And everybody else should praise me for it. We've made a choice. And choices are intention. I, anybody who's watched a trial before will notice that in, in any criminal case, generally speaking, when it comes down to closing arguments, this is the same argument they'll make. Regardless of what the evidence is, if there's any evidence that supports the crime, they'll say that, that may be support of the crime happening, sure. But doesn't prove intent. In fact, it might not even prove uh, that they intend to do anything wrong in the first place. Maybe they were a victim of circumstance. Intent is where evil comes in. The same thing comes with greed. A greedy person might end up with a whole bunch of stuff, but perhaps they weren't doing it because they wanted it. Maybe it just happened. I think about, um... Ah, I know, perfect example. Everybody should be familiar with the game Minecraft, even if you're not a gamer. If you've even been remotely close to the computer sphere, or if you've been close to children, everybody knows Minecraft. A great example would be Notch, the man who made Minecraft. Minecraft is one of the most successful games ever made. And it also made Notch absolutely miserable because he wanted to make a game... 
he never intended for it to be that kind of successful. He never wanted the attention, and he honestly, in many interviews, uh, stated that he had no idea what to do with the money and resources that he had. He had them, of course. But it wasn't because of greed. He was just successful on a level that he never, never even imagined. And he was quite charitable with it. So, you could not say that he was greedy, he just had it. Now, other places, and I'm going to go to the easiest punching bag there is, just because I love punching this bag. Electronic Arts, otherwise known as EA. Now, EA got in some hot water a couple of years ago because they released a game called Star Wars Battlefront 2. Now, what the game is doesn't matter. It's really immaterial here. It's a Star Wars game. Everyone knows what Star Wars. That's all you need to know. What was important was that when they released the game, in order... Well, the game had multiple classes that you could play in and multiple heroes that you could play as. However, when you started the game, you were given exactly one. Now, on its own, that would not necessarily be a problem. You were given one class, and you were told that if you want to play the others, you'll have to play the game and earn them. Well, that's what games are for. They're for earning things. What they didn't tell people is that you had to collect pieces to combine into these characters, and that would allow you to unlock them. So you had to put in a certain number of hours, because everything was random chance, and then you'd be able to earn the character you wanted to play. The same thing was also true of the heroes, where you would have to play matches, and there was a lower chance to get hero pieces to unlock those heroes to be played later on. While this all sounds good in concept, what they didn't tell people, and that internet sleuths managed to decrypt from the game's source code, is that you would have to play hundreds, sometimes thousands of hours to earn some of these heroes. A literal investment of enough time, because they, they say the 10,000 hour rule, you spend 10,000 hours in, in a particular skill to become a professional at it, to become, you know, truly proficient. So if you wanted to play piano, you, you could uh, spend 10,000 hours to become proficient at the piano. They wanted you to spend the same time in this game just to unlock the game. Or alternately, you could simply pay them money to bypass the whole thing. And that was the rub. See, it wasn't that they wanted you to earn it. That was an option that needed to be there because otherwise their ploy would have just been too naked and obvious. The entire point was they wanted to sell you the game and then sell you the rest of the game because they intentionally kept it out. And by making the process of actually unlocking the game nigh impossible, they were able to rake in hundreds of thousands of dollars from people who either didn't want to or literally couldn't put in the thousands of hours needed to get what they had rightfully paid for. This is an example of greed to an absolute degree. And why is that? Well, obviously the game was very profitable. It was a Star Wars game, of course. How could it not be profitable? But it was intentionally made to short the people who had bought it by not giving them what they expected, by not giving them what was advertised to them even, and to rake in even more money by selling them the entire thing piecemeal. These weren't add-ons. This wasn't DLC that came afterwards. This was actual parts of the game that had been stripped out and then sold back at a price. This is greed incarnate. And it was a choice. It was intentional. And this is where intention or this is where intention comes into being part of evil. You cannot be evil accidentally. You can hurt somebody accidentally. 
maybe you lose your temper with somebody and you commit wrath. Now, an attorney in like a murder case would argue, and I'm not necessarily sure that I agree, that premeditation can happen instantly. I don't agree with that. That may be the legal case, but I don't believe it's the moral case. I believe that somebody who turns around and lashes out is not necessarily guilty of wrath. I believe that in order for you to be guilty of wrath, you would have to... What's the, what's the word I want here? You, you would have to cultivate it. Cultivate's a good word there, yeah. You, you would need to be a wrathful person. You would need to indulge in it. A momentary act of anger is, is not wrath. I don't necessarily know that it would be a sin. I'm not going to call it evil. It happens. We are imperfect beings. However, if you are intentionally always looking for a fight, if you intentionally always leap off at the slightest, the, the, the slightest touch, if your first reaction to any conflict is to jump to, to anger or violence, then yes, you are choosing. And that is intention. And I go down this road and I explain intention because this is the lens. I told you at the beginning of this that the entire purpose here is I wanted to give you a lens to use in your daily life. I want you to use this lens. Hold it up to your eye like a monocle. Whenever you look at somebody's actions and you try to determine whether they're being good or bad or whether they're being good or evil. Well, good or mistaken or good and evil. Um, I wish that I could find an example of somebody being mistaken, but uh, they're, they're so hard to come by these days. Um... No, I really can't come up with one. I, I can't. And I'm trying really hard to come up with a, a, a political policy or law that's been passed in recent years that I could simply call a mistake. Because as we found out that most things that might have been considered mistakes have been absolutely maliciously or malicious intentionally. I think that for the time being, I'm going to go back to California. And I'm going to reuse the example that I used last time. And I want, to, I want to reuse the idea of petty theft and criminal theft. Because this is actually a pretty easy and a pretty harmless one. But it's a good example that we can use. So California is obviously a very liberal state. Especially Southern California. Very liberal. They believe in tenets such as equality and equity. They believe diversity they believe inclusion, they believe in all these things. Now, by and large, these things are not bad. Equality is a good thing. I don't think that many people are going to necessarily disagree with that. We may disagree with the definition of it, but nobody disagrees that equality is really good. Most people will argue the difference between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. Which is where I fall in that. I believe in equality of opportunity. Nobody should be stopped from participating, but the opportunity to participate does not guarantee your, your ability to succeed. You just shouldn't be stopped from trying. Now, that also means that nobody should get in your way while you're trying, and that's, a, that's where they argue, or that's where the argument comes in, because people who argue for equality of outcome argue that we've already interfered and thus there was never an e equal opportunity to begin with. That is a whole different discussion I'm not going to get into. That, that's the deepest we're going on that. Inclusion? Well, inclusion kind of goes with equal opportunity. Everybody should be included in equal opportunity. Nobody should be held out for any reason. Diversity? The U.S. was literally founded on diversity. I, there's a reason why it says, send me your poor, send me your hungry, send me your, your weary. I forget what the plaque says. 
Of course, we have taken that a little bit too far. The idea was that we were supposed to be all Americans. We were not supposed to have enclaves. The idea was you come here, you become American. You can bring your culture with you, but once you're here, you're part of the American culture, and we incorporate a little bit of everything. Not, you bring your own culture and live your own culture while you're here. That was the difference. But still, we enjoy diversity. I love tacos. Everybody loves tacos. We would not have tacos if it wasn't for diversity. That's a fact. You can take that one to the bank. So these are not bad things. However, could they be mistaken or could they be evil? Well, let's think about that. The reason why I want to use theft in California is because, well, it's actually a pretty easy one for us to judge whether it is a good or evil act. Very simply, you have stuff. How would you feel if somebody took your stuff? Most of us would not want our stuff taken. Most of us would say that theft is bad. I mean, if we were to commit theft, then we would say, okay, great, I have a thing. I took my thing from that person. And then what if somebody comes and takes one of your other things? Well, now you're like, wait, no, he took my thing. That makes me sad. No, we, 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 don't, we don't take things that don't belong to us. We, we have to teach this to children when they're very young because children don't understand this. Is the child guilty of being evil? No, the child is ignorant. It doesn't know what it's doing. We have to teach. This is where intention comes in. The child may not know what it's doing. It doesn't necessarily understand intention. It has to be taught intention. So, we all agree that theft is generally bad. So what happened in California? Well, theft is bad, they said. And thus, they had laws against it. But then they came in and they said, well, theft is bad. However, we're seeing a whole lot of people who take things that are, are being, um, that, that are being arrested. And we think that they're being disproportionate. Because we think that we're not being equal on this. There's too many people of this group and not enough people of another group. And so they said, this runs up against our whole equality objective, okay? Things need to be equal. We need equity. Everything must be equal. This is what equity means. Equity means all things equal. So they said, because we don't have equity, what we're going to do is we're going to change the laws on theft. So we are now going to say theft is no longer bad. Okay? And because we have made theft no longer bad, we will now have equity. And so what was the result of that? Well, this happened a few years ago, so we have lots of data now. The result was theft went up by, like, a lot. Because when they said that theft was no longer bad, well, bad people started stealing more. I thought that was really the only conclusion that anybody could come to. And most normal people disagreed with it. There were some people who, who did agree with it, and... This is where we get into the idea of what is evil and what is a simple neutral actor. By and large, somebody who would be neutral is somebody who doesn't even know what the argument is. And there is a secondary argument for whether or not they're evil, but we'll get into that shortly. But somebody who is not informed, doesn't have a stake in it, somebody who is not involved at all in this, is generally neutral. However, you did have many people who were arguing for that, and the end result was, of course, that we saw a massive spike in crimes, especially when it came to, like, businesses, because when they, they said that theft would no longer be criminal, they increased the, the amount of stolen goods up to, like, $1,000, which meant that people could literally walk into a store, fill up an entire shopping cart, and walk out. 
Well, the end result was that the stores couldn't keep up their business because they were losing all their product. And what were the knock-on effects of that? Well, after they had lost enough product and they could no longer stay in business, they closed. And once the stores were closed, well, now not only did those people no longer have a store to steal from, the other people in the area no longer had a store to shop from. They have harmed the community. Their actions are now affecting other people. I mean, they were in the first place. They were affecting the store. But now they have affected everybody who worked there, everybody who shopped there, the general overall economic health of the community, or maybe even the region, depending on how big the place was. They have harmed their community. They are committing evil acts. Nobody's going to argue that. But I don't want to talk about the people who are doing the stealing. The people who are doing the stealing are absolutely already evil. They are greedy. They are greedy because they will, or they'll just take whatever they want. Perhaps they're also slothful because while they could be working, they choose not to. After all, why work when you can just take? They're prideful because they believe that they have the right to. But I, like I said, I don't want to spend too much time on them because what I want to get into is the people who made the decisions in the first place. And this is where intention is going to get in. Now, these people who made these changes to the theft laws because they wanted to do good, because they wanted equity, were their actions evil? It's actually really, really easy to argue that they weren't. These people were acting in what they thought was the best interest of this group of people. They were trying to fix what they saw as a problem. And I don't think that anybody is going to necessarily call them evil for that. Not inherently. The problem comes in that most people with any kind of knowledge of history knew what was going to happen. Like as soon as they signed the paper. Anybody with the slightest, the slightest comprehension of logical pro progression, which we covered last time on our lecture, would know that if you decide to not make a crime illegal, then the crime is going to go up. These people took this action, you have to assume with the full knowledge of what the consequences would be, they would get their more equitable outcome, but they were willing to do so at the expense of the increased crime. And now is where we're going to start getting into intention, because now that we've established that they were willing to do this and why they were doing it, we have to get into, was it intentional? We have to make a few assumptions here. We cannot make an absolute assumption, but what we can do is infer some of them. And I'll be honest with you, none of them are good. Even if we cannot establish a single intention that is the absolute truth, none of them are good. The first and most charitable one is that they assume that by passing this law and decriminalizing theft, they would benefit a group. And they would do so at what they hoped, what they were hoping, would be a marginal increase in crime that would not severely negatively impact the rest of the community. This is the most charitable assumption we can make. Because they had to know that there was going to be some kind of consequence. They just believed that whatever the increase in consequences were, people would still be able to move on with their lives and we would have a better and hopefully more prosperous society. Obviously that didn't happen, 
but I guess you can't fault an optimist for being an optimist. Unfortunately, they only get worse from here, because the second assumption we can make is that they hoped that this would in would increase the equity for their chosen group, and they did not care what the consequences would be for the rest of the community. As in, they knew that there would be an increase in crime. They knew that it would be potentially severe. They knew that it would potentially have knock-on effects and that it would benefit basically no one. You would just have less of your chosen group being arrested for your crime. Which, I mean, that's, that's pretty close to what we got, but still not quite there. And it still gets worse, because if we assume that it wasn't those first two, then we would have to make the assumption that they actually never intended for it to benefit anybody. We would have to assume that they intentionally did this knowing full well the full catastrophic damage that repeat or repealing, suspending, abdicating, I don't know what you want to call it, but that, that removing this, this crime from the books, or decriminalizing it, would have on the community. And they did it anyway. Not for the benefit of anyone else. Perhaps not even for the benefit of themselves. But they did it just because... they wanted to? Just for laughs? We're not sure. And yet that's still not the last assumption that we can make. Because there is one more that we can make. There's one more. And that is that we can make the assumption that they made this change. They decriminalized theft. Not to actually help a certain community. Not to help a certain group of people. But to actively harm that group of people and the community because it benefited themselves. Now, how could it possibly benefit them? Well, there is a saying that goes back a very, very long time. I'm not exactly sure how far back it goes. It might go back to, like, the 1960s. It might go all the way back to the 1800s. It might even go back to, like, revolutionary France. I'm not sure how far back it goes. But it simply states, never let a good crisis go to waste. The fact is that times of crisis and turmoil throughout history have always been useful as a vessel for increased overreaching power. Almost every crisis that we have seen in every single country in the world, whether it was an act of war, whether it was an act of terrorism, whatever it was, Almost every single crisis has been used as a vessel for increased overreaching power to the king, to the prime minister, to the church, to the government as a whole. And this has been used, at least in California, as just that. This is just one of many laws that they have passed that has decriminalized things further throwing their, their population and their, their communities into turmoil. And of course, if everything is bad, then you have to fix it. In order to fix it, though, you need to have the appropriate tools to fix it. And for a leader of whatever kind, whether that be king, president, or just government in general, that means more power. So if we, dis if we can assert, and we can't, not with 100% um, knowledge, but if we can make the assumption that they have done this for the self-serving reason of getting themselves more power, we can effectively establish that the actions they have taken 
were evil by their very nature. And as we established, you know, through Thomas in Hinduism, or through intentional action in the Abrahamic religions, taking evil actions intentionally makes you an evil person. The intention has everything to do with it. Now, theft was a very easy one. However, when we look at the combination of other things that they've done in California, and I, I'm, I feel a little bit bad picking on California, but they are just such, such a perfect example. They're the low-hanging fruit here. I mean, I, I could easily go for, say, the Chinese example. That would be easy, too, but I'm going to stick with California because we're already here. California has a homelessness problem. Once upon a time, the homelessness problem would have been dealt with by dealing with people who were camping, either arresting those who were doing so, trying to get help for those you could, or if they couldn't be helped, if they could not be helped, then committing them somewhere. I'm not saying that you have to lock every single homeless person up in an institution. I'm, what I'm saying is, if you wanted to solve the problem, you would first get the homeless people off the streets. You would then try to help them establish lives. You would find housing for them. You would find jobs for them. You would find therapy for the people who needed it. You would find medication for the people who needed it. You would get them into programs to help them kick any drug habits they might have. And you would help them try to get established into a better life. People who either could not or refuse to, then unfortunately you're faced with a situation where you have a person who does not want to play by the rules. They do not want to follow the laws. They will repeatedly break the laws. And then you're left with basically one of three options. Imprisonment, exile, or death. Now, the latter of that might be a little bit harsh. Definitely not advocating for that. But unfortunately, if you have a community, and you have laws in that community, and you have people in your community who do not want to, like, they have the choice, but they refuse to abide by them, then you only basically have two options. You can either imprison them for potentially forever, or you have to remove them from the community. That would basically be march them to the edge of your community and send them off somewhere else. Which exile is not something that we do anymore. I'm not sure why. We should do it more often, I think. It seems like the, uh, it seems like the more humanitarian option, since you can just give somebody some food, Give them some money and say, if you come back, you're, you go to prison, period. I don't know. If, if it was my choice between exile or living the rest of my life in a concrete box, I think I would take the exile. But we don't do that anymore. Anyway, though, this is how you would solve the problem. And this is, this is not just my opinion. This is the opinion of almost every single humanitarian worker out there. Every humanitarian worker out there will say, house them, feed them, job them, treat them. Because anything less is not going to solve the problem. But what are we doing? Well, in California, what are we doing? We are letting these people stay. When a homeless encampment shows up, we don't do anything about it. We let them stay. When there is violence or drug use inside of it, do we go through and arrest the people causing it? No, we let them do it. And if somebody wants to you know, try to take the law into their own hands and clear it out themselves, we arrest that person. And you cannot tell me that they don't know what's going on. We know they do. 
a really great example was out of Texas. I believe it was in, where was it? It's a, I want to say San Antonio, but I'm not sure. It was a border town. Is San Antonio a border town? I don't think it is. Either way, it was, um, it was a place on the border somewhere. And the president of the United States paid a visit. I believe it was the first time he had visited the border. Now, because there has been such an explosive amount of immigration, well, not immigration because they're not immigrating, they're just entering. Since there have been such an explosive number of people entering the country through, uh, from Mexico, and they had no housing, no food, no really anything, you had had massive encampments of basically just homeless people, home, homeless people who were entering the country illegally, on the streets. What happened, though, when the president came to visit? All of those streets got cleaned up. All those people were removed and every piece of trash was picked up. Which means that the people who are there, who, who are in charge of this town, know exactly what's going on and they know what's wrong. But they choose to do nothing about it. They only did something about it when it would look bad for them to have it there at the wrong time. The same thing is simultaneously true in California and has been for a couple of years now at least. These things have always existed. And when it comes to places like Skid Row, Skid Row is like one of the biggest permanent homeless encampments ever. It's always existed as far as I know. It's always been there. It's allowed to stay there, though, because the people don't want to do anything about it. And why? Well, because to some people, the act of doing so would make them look bad. And they absolutely do not want to look bad for anything. The idea of using law and order, and in particular, because law is violence. Because they don't want to appear as violent and mean... They do nothing instead. That's an intention. And it's an intention that goes back to what we were just showing on the screen. I probably shouldn't have taken it off, but I did. They don't want to be seen as being mean or violent. Well, that just means that you want to make your, your image look better than you probably actually are. That's pride. It's also, to a certain degree, envy, because you want to look better than you are. It is evil to do something that you know is wrong. Or, alternately, to do something that you know is... or to not do something you know is right. But that's going to be getting into something a little bit more, a little bit more nuanced, and that's probably a good place to segue into it. Not doing what you know is right. Now, to a certain extent, that would be covered under sloth. After all, sloth is just not doing things. Okay? We, discover, or we discussed that a while back in more detail. We're not going to rehash it all here. But sloth is a deadly sin, as we established, because if you don't do something, then nothing gets done. If you don't plant crops, you don't eat. If you don't fix the roof, it leaks. If you don't stack firewood, you freeze over the winter. But what if it's not any physical thing? What if something is wrong and you simply do nothing? Maybe it doesn't require you to actually do anything. What if, say, you're walking through a door and you notice that the, the rug in front of the door has been folded and flipped and crumpled and everything else, and it is a major tripping hazard, okay? You're there, you're right there, you open the door, you see it. What if you say, it's not my job to fix the rug, someone else's job. Now, you could say, you could say that, you know, Somebody's going to trip over that rug, okay? Somebody's going to trip over that rug and they're going to get hurt. And I'm going to hide over here 
because I want to see them get hurt. Well, now we're treading on wrathful territory because you are actively looking to hurt somebody else. That is obviously an evil act, but what if you simply say, it's not my job. Maybe somebody else will fix it. Maybe somebody will trip over it. Either way, it's not my problem. Just like those people that we discussed in California who said, you know what? I don't know anything about the crimes going on. I don't know anything about the groups. I don't know anything about the politicians. I'm just not going to get involved. It's not my job. Now we're treading on the territory of the banality of evil. Now, for those of you who don't know, let's see if I can get a good definition here. So, banality. If I could spell it right. There we go. So, banality is def or defined as the condition or quality of being banal, which, of course, is just circular. However, if we go to the, um, the definition of banal, it's an adjective. It's devoid of freshness or originality. It's hackneyed or trite. It's a really awful definition, but it's the definition we've got. The banality of evil is basically... The absolute minimum amount of evil, and it's basically the evil of negligence or ignorance. It's the idea of you cannot even put in a modicum of effort. It is the evil of sloth. Now, sloth was already deadly before, but when it comes to fighting evil... It is said, and I don't know where the quote comes from, that evil thrives when good men do nothing. Now, why does that, why, why has that saying persisted for so long? Because it's true, and it thrives on the banality of evil. It's the idea of the, the, the conspirator, well, not the conspirator, but the, ah, uh, what's the word that I want here? Not, not conspirator, not even accomplice. But it is kind of an accomplice. It's somebody who just doesn't care enough that they would not lift a finger to stop a bad thing from happening. Somebody is robbing a bank. You see it happening. You have a phone. You could call 911. You're not in any danger. You see it from across the street. But you do nothing. You see somebody being harassed on the street, perhaps even beat up. But you do nothing. It's the idea that it's not your job, it's not your problem, and even though you could do something to intervene, you choose not to. This is the essence of the banality of evil. And again, we come back to intention. Unlike the previous one where we were intending to do an action, this is where we intend to do nothing. Now, is it the same degree, the same caliber of evil as before? Well, no, it's not. And I don't think that many people would argue that it is. Some definitely would. Some absolutely would. By and large, though, most people would argue that it is lesser, but it is evil all the same. And we see this every single day in our lives. We see it in people who have arguments but don't do research. We, we see it in people who maybe are activists and take actions or demand actions without actually thinking about the consequences of those actions. And we see it in people who are observers to either evil or malicious acts but do nothing to stop them. And hello, Tux. Good to have you here. The banality of evil is actually, I would argue, more pervasive than active acts of evil on their own, simply because it requires so little effort on any person's part. It is one of the reasons why we have seen so many actions like, 
I would go so far as to say a great example would have been the rise of the Nazi power in 1930s Germany. Many people, especially now, can look back in time and say the Nazis, okay? One of the most evil groups that we have ever had in human history. By far not the only ones, however, they were evil and they were proficient at it. And what many people ask is, how were they ever allowed to do this in the first place? Now, that's a very nuanced question, because there was a lot going on at the time. There was the split in Weimar Germany, there was the communists and the socialists and everything else. There was a lot going on. But by and large, how did it happen? A lot of it was because people let it happen. There's a reason why we have so many stories. Uh, they're, they're, they're treated as heroic stories about people in Nazi Germany who went out of their way to hide Jews and to try and smuggle them out of the country however they could. The reason why is because those people were, by and large, a minority. What did most of the people in Germany during the Nazi regime do? They did nothing. They went to work. They woke up in the morning. They had their breakfast. They went to work. They did their work. They came home to their families, to their homes. They went to sleep, and the next day they got up and did it again. Did they vote? Eh, maybe. Probably. I'm not sure what the, uh, the political system was back then. But I do know that the Nazi party was voted into power, so somebody voted for it. How many of those people had any idea what they were voting for in the first place? Now, to a certain extent, we can give them a small pass. We have to remember that we live in the information age right now, where we know pretty much everything there is to know almost as soon as it happens. As I record this, there is like an SPV or something like that bank in California that has completely failed and dissolved. This happened. This is a major bank, one of the biggest banks in the United States, which funded almost the entire tech industry. And it just happened in the last 24 hours. This is going to have major ramifications across the entire world. Primarily in the United States, but the ripples of this will will extend across the entire planet. It happened 24 hours ago. It is Saturday as we as I'm recording this and as, as I'm broadcasting this. It is the weekend. It is the time that news goes to die. But I know about this because we live in the information age. I didn't need a newspaper. It was online. We know about everything that happens instantly. And Tuxedo says, uh, yeah, I decided long ago that stupid is a greater evil than malevolence. Stupid enables malevolence, and stupid is bulletproof. God, I want to disagree with that, but I can't. <laughs> I really can't. But anyway, um, we, we know about this bank failing less than 24 hours after it happened. However, Nazi Germany rose in the 1930s. I don't think that they really had the radio back then. The radio, I think, was still in roughly its infancy. And I will guarantee you that most homes probably did not have one. Hell, I would probably argue that most homes probably did not have electricity at that point. Which means that whatever news people got was little. They got whatever was delivered to them, possibly by newspaper. If maybe you lived in a more metropolitan area, and if you didn't live in a metropolitan area, you got whatever news came in from town by rumor. So we can't blame the people too much. That does not mean, however, that they were not entirely without sin. Yeah, as it were. We do have information from back then. And while most people 
might not have known what was going on at the beginning of the Nazi regime. We do know that they knew full well what was going on by the end of it. That means that somewhere in that uh, roughly, what was it, like 1933 through 1945, so somewhere in that 12-year span, enough people would have known that something could have been done. I mean, we're talking about a revolution from the inside of Germany, and while maybe that was asking a bit much of them, given the Nazi war machine, doing nothing when you know evil is being committed is just this side of committing the same evil yourself. I do believe that Spider-Man said it best. When you have the power to stop the bad things and you do nothing, the bad things happen because of you. And this is the inherence of the banality of evil. You can't blame somebody who doesn't know what's going on of not stopping a thing because they don't know what's going on. The banality of evil requires knowledge. So you cannot blame the ignorant, necessarily. But again, we also have to go back to intention, action, and choice. While we cannot blame the banality, or we, yeah, we cannot blame the banality of evil on the ignorant, we can now also further divide this between the ignorant and the willfully ignorant. Again, we get back to the idea of choice and intention. All of us are ignorant to something. In fact, I would dare say most of us are ignorant to most things. There is a lot of information out there, and nobody can keep up with everything. Otherwise, we would all have doctorates in every subject in school. It's impossible. So we're all ignorant of, other, uh, of many things in the world. The question is, however, when you're presented with information, do you then take it or ignore it? Now, this is where the dividing line comes in. Whether you agree with the information you're given or disagree with it, do you take it? This is where, some, or where things like debate come in, especially when you hear people who refuse to debate. There's a lot of people these days who will refuse to debate anything. The idea is actually very simple. You know things. Everybody knows things. But let's say that somebody tells you a thing that goes contrary to what you know. Now you are left with a question, a choice. What do you do with it? You can refute it. Maybe you can present argument an argument against it. Maybe you have evidence. You can engage with this person who is trying to, you know, tell you a thing. Perhaps you can prove them wrong. However, you should at least entertain the argument. This is where we get into pride again, because pride would assume that you know what you know, and you know that you're correct. So you don't need to engage with anybody else. Your pride says that you are right. Humility would say you could be wrong. And so you accept this argument and you say, let's, let's talk about it. Pride, which would cause you to ignore this, would also lead you to, say, make a, a mistake out of your own pride because you don't know any better. And you would not know any better because you have deliberately chosen to ignore whatever information you've been given. You didn't do your due diligence. Now, maybe you're right. Okay, if you're right, then congratulations, you got lucky. What if you're wrong, though? Being prideful of what you know and acting on what could be bad information could lead you to commit greater evils in your own sense of superiority. We've seen that many times. I would go to China and the Soviet Union for that. 
in the Soviet Union, it would be their five-year plan, which, by the way, their five-year plan turned into like six or seven different five-year plans. None of them worked. In China, you had the Great Leap Forward, as well as I believe you had three-year plans, five-year plans, and ten-year plans. Spoiler alert, none of those worked either. And why? Because these people were so convinced that they were right and everybody else was wrong, that they were willing to commit any evil in making sure that it happened. And be assured, great evils were committed to the tune of millions of lives. Willful ignorance. None of these people would have listened to any evidence or any argument put in front of them. Because of that, they, they, they were willing to commit atrocities. But it doesn't have to be atrocities on a national scale. As we have seen, and you know, it doesn't really matter which side of the political spectrum you fall on, because each side thoroughly believes that the other side is evil, and they will also accuse each other of this, no matter which side you will uh, you fall on the political spectrum, you firmly believe that the other side is willfully ignorant of all politics and policy that they're voting on. And this is actually a really fun example to use because, quite frankly, everybody agrees. We're not on the same side, but everybody agrees, whether you're Democrat whether you're Republican, whether you're conservative, whether you're liberal, we all agree on one thing. The other side should not be allowed to vote. Because they don't know what they're talking about, they don't know the policies, they don't know who's on the ballot. And there's actually good evidence for this. So it's not just that we have these people who are saying these things. We actually have evidence for this one. And the evidence is in straight ticket voting. Now, I don't know if this exists in other countries because I haven't studied their election systems very well. But I do know that in many places in the United States, we have what's called straight ticket voting. And give me a sec, I need a drink. I've been talking for an hour and 40 minutes now and I haven't had a drink yet. Ah, good water. Straight ticket voting. So, when you're given a ballot in the United States to fill out, no matter whether you do it by paper ballot or by electronic ballot, whatever you do, generally speaking, you'll be given choices for, say, the president, and then for, say, a judge or a senator or a House member, whatever. You're given choices, and you simply pick whichever person you want for the job. That's how voting usually works. I think we're all familiar with that. But in some places, and this is definitely not universal, they have the option of what's called straight ticket voting, where you can check one box and you can vote for everybody of a certain party. Just automatically, one box and done. So what's the problem in this? Well, Inherently, there is no problem. After all, if you were going to vote for these people anyway, if you had done your due diligence, you had researched their platforms, their positions, their promises, and everything else, and you want your, you were going to fill in all those names anyway, then there's really nothing wrong with simply checking that one box and voting for everything. Where does it become a problem, though? The problem comes in with the willfully ignorant. If you are a person who just walks in to the ballot and checks off a certain box to vote everything because that's just what you do, which would imply that you have done no research, you have no idea what you're voting for, who you're voting for, maybe you didn't even read the names. 
maybe you just voted for the the R or the D on the ballot, and that was it. And there is no better example of this than, where was it? I think it was New Hampshire? I think it was New Hampshire, but I could be wrong on that. The state actually doesn't matter, but it was the last election in the 20, I think it was the 2020 election. It was a municipal election, I believe. It was for like mayor or a town council seat or something like that. I forget. The point is, however, that on the ballot, they had all these people and there was a woman who got on there. And when she got on there, she ran as a Republican. And yes, I do tend to align with the Republicans, so I'm, I'm calling you people out. She ran as one. The problem is that she was a... Let's see, what, what, what all was it? She was like a trans-lesbian Satanist or something like that. And, of course, she won because she had the R next to her name. And when she came, or when she won, during her acceptance speech... She literally used the platform up there to call them out saying, I am all of these things that you hate. All of you hate everything that I stand for. And you voted for me because I put an R next to my name. And she was right. Every single one of those people who didn't want her in that position, but voted for her because they didn't even know who she was, they just followed the party letter next to her name. All of them were guilty of the banality of evil. Tuck says the right to vote is also a responsibility. A responsibility requires research well, Research before 10 minutes before you enter the ballot box. Not voting is better than ignorant voting. And I will agree, it is. However, that does not mean that not voting is good either. Now we're getting into the lesser of two evils, and I don't even want to talk about that. I'm not even going to get into that. Because that, that one's been done to death, and I think we all agree that the lesser of two evils is still evil. But no, I, I, I agree with everything you said there. These people didn't, didn't do anything. They literally chose to do nothing when they should have. When they had action to take, they chose to take none. When they chose to act, they acted out of ignorance of their own volition. And what did they get? Well, in this case, it was harmless. Far as I know, whoever this woman is, she hasn't done anything wrong. I don't even know if she stayed. She might have stepped down from the position. But she seemed like a fine person to me. Do I agree with everything she does? Eh, I don't necessarily care, to be honest. But they got all mad, and it was their own fault. Which, by the way, they got all mad because of it. That, that tends to fall into wrath. Yeah. I mean, I said that I wouldn't excuse people, or I would give people an excuse for, um... For, you know, a moment of wrathful behavior. But in this case, getting mad at somebody because of your own decisions. Yeah, that falls under wrath. Don't do it. This is, again, a, a perfect example of the banality of evil. Because you chose not to do something. You have now damaged your community. Again, this case was rather, rather, um... Rather harmless. But could you imagine that on a bigger scale? Could you imagine if that was, say, the governor who wanted to start instituting satanic practices into the, into the uh, state? That could be a problem. After all, Satanism, which I've never really talked about, but in short, Satanism glorifies the seven deadly sins. Just to turn this thing back on, the very concept of Satanism is that these things should not be necessarily discounted, that they should be glorified and indulged in because they are not bad for you. 
you should be prideful for yourself. You should be as diligent or as thoughtful as you want. Wrath is an expression. Gluttony is your choice to indulge. You should be envious of other people. Because if we weren't envious of each other, then how would we progress as a species? Lust is a natural biological function and should not be shamed. And greed is not bad. We should all get everything we want. That is the crux of Satanism. I think we can already establish why it doesn't work on a larger scale. But imagine if you had somebody like this in charge of your entire political system. I have a feeling that things would go bad very quickly. So because this was a harmless one, but people like this vote in this way all the time. I would even go so far as to say it is the vast majority of people. Keep in mind that in the 2020 election, if I remember my, my, um, my votes right, I believe Donald Trump, and I'm going to ignore the, the lesser um, candidates, Donald Trump had 75 million votes, and I believe that Biden got 79 to 80 million votes. That totals up to be about 155 100, to 160 million votes, okay? The United States has a population of roughly, I do believe, 375 million. That's barely a third. And if you want me to believe that even half of the people who voted in the election on either side, on any side, knew full well what they were voting for? Yeah, I don't buy it. Maybe you can call that pessimistic. I call it realistic. I would wager that the majority of people did not have any idea what they were voting for. They were voting either off of emotion or habit or, as Tux said in his, his comment, the problem is that propaganda is good at getting people angry or scared at the last minute. Well, I, actually, I do believe that. That's the reason why, actually, uh, flyers and propaganda are supposed to be kept away from polling booths. But I do believe that people buy into propaganda. It's emotional. I believe that a lot of people vote that way. Do I want to call these people evil? Well, unfortunately, I think you kind of have to. To what degree, though, and what do we do about it? The unfortunate thing is, and I said this at the beginning of this stream, and I'm going to repeat it again here, I don't have answers. And I'm not going to even try to give you one. I don't have them. The only answer that I can give to this particular problem is vigilance. The same thing that applies to everything else in your life. You have to be conscientious. You have to be observant. And more importantly, when you see something wrong, you have to correct it. If you see somebody who is getting a little bit too prideful, you have to try to bring them back down to earth. If you, if you notice that people or somebody is being greedy, you have to... Maybe stop them, especially if they're breaking laws or harming other people in the process. How do you do that? I don't know. I don't have a single answer that's going to fix everything. Nobody does. That's the problem with this. It's very difficult. Well, I don't have a solution, though. This is what I came to do, is I wanted to just put it out there so that you would know at least what to look for. There, there is a saying that language controls thought. If you can control words and you can control language, you can control thought. Because we all think through language. If you cannot describe a thing, then you cannot convey or know a thing. If we didn't already know what an apple was, 
how could we convey to somebody what an apple is? Besides just grabbing one and showing them. We need to have words. We need to have language to convey thought. And part of having words and language to convey those thoughts is to know how to identify the things in the first place. Even if we have the words and the language to convey evil, you can't do that unless you can identify it in the first place. And so I hope that today I have at least given you the tools you need to look at something and say, is it evil? Is it misguided? Is it accidental? Or is it intentional? The unfortunate part is, there's not a whole lot of accidental or negligent anymore these days. Most people in general, especially if they're in positions of leadership, know what they're doing. When it comes to negligence or ignorance, I think about activists. It doesn't really matter what cause, what, what the cause is or where in the world it is. I think about activists. I think about people who have a cause. Something that they believe in passionately. Something that they would do almost anything to support. Maybe it's a, a great ill that needs to be solved. Maybe it's, it's some people that need to be helped. But they would go to any length and do anything to either stop this problem or help this group. I don't generally consider those people evil. Not in the, not in the pure sense. Banal, yes. I, I think they could absolutely, and in, in general, are guilty of the banality of evil. Because most of them are so focused on trying to fix the problem that they never actually stop to consider whether the actions they're taking are helpful. And they tend to trust, they tend to trust the people in charge that those leaders they have are acting in the best interest. And so they never question. Tuck says, uh, once you're aware of, of the control language has, you can break your mind away from using language to determine your thought process. It does still hold true from the baseline. You just got to grow away from it. Um, it does make sense, kinda. I think it could have been worded a little bit better. Um, more importantly, once you understand the control that language has... You can identify when people are trying to use language to control you. Then you can either stop using the same language they are, or you can simply remove those people from your life. Period. But yeah, um, things like activists, I would call the banality of evil because they're not intending to do bad but they are doing bad and they're not questioning it. So, yeah, those are some good examples. And then our leaders, I don't think this is even really a left-right, Republican, Democrat, conservative, liberal, Tory, labor, whatever question. I think most of our leaders are evil in general. To different degrees, yes, but... Every single one of them takes action. And we do demand that they take action. And almost every single one of them does what they do. And al almost every single time they do it, it hurts somebody. And I cannot imagine that they, they take the actions they do without knowing what the, the outcomes for their actions will be. I think many of them try to justify it by saying that it will be mitigated in some way. It may also be part of the, it, it may also be the fact that maybe the problems they're working on are simply unsolvable. Which leaves them in a real catch-22. Somebody who is in government could have been elected to solve a problem. 
maybe that problem has no solution. Do we still hold them accountable for trying to solve an unsolvable problem? It's hard. But as they say, the road to hell is paved with the best of intentions. Intentions do still matter. Maybe if you take an action, you will do harm. If you take no action, it will do harm. What do you do then? Unfortunately, the real world, in the real world, morality is a real-life trolley problem. So we try to mitigate as best we can. If you're religious, you believe that your actions will be judged later on. If you're not religious, then you just try to do the best you can with an imperfect system. But there's still going to be people that are going to consider you evil, and perhaps you are. This is where introspection and humility come in. Again, I don't have any answers. There may not be one. And anybody who's trying to peddle you an answer... I'll tell you right now, anybody who tries to say they know the answer, you stay far away from that person because they don't. They don't know the answer. They're just trying to figure it out like the rest of us are. But now at least you have the tools you need to go through the world and determine the intentions of people and whether or not that you should even be around them. Because if you can identify truly evil people, stay away from them, like as much as possible. I, some things just can't be helped. I believe it was... I, I don't know who said it, but I, lo I saw it on a shirt and I loved it. It said, God gave his angels weapons because even the Lord knew you don't fight evil with love and tolerance. Evil cannot be fixed. You just stay away from it. Or you deal with it. Uh, one, one or the other, because there's no half measures there. Anyway, though, I hope that you have found this, this lecture useful, informative, entertaining, infuriating. You can find it infuriating. You can hate watch this. I'll take hate watches. I'll take any watches, really. <laughs> I'm not picky. Anyway, though, I think this is where I'm going to go ahead and cut it off. Uh, I think this was a good lecture, though. I'm glad to get this one off my chest, because this one has been rolling around for a while now. Um, I still have some of your suggestions from a previous stream, but as I get out of here, if you have any other topics that you would like me to cover, just let me know either in the stream comments or in the comments below. Preferably in the comments below or on the Discord, because those are easier for me to reference. Live comments are kind of hard because, you know, it, it's live. If I go back to read this in, like, the YouTube studio, yeah, it doesn't have just, like, a transcript of everything. Or if it does, I haven't found it yet. So, comments below after the video or on the Discord. That's much better. But anyway, if you've enjoyed this lecture, subscribe to the channel. If, if you're not already subscribed, I think most everyone here is, though. Uh, don't forget to... Hit the bell icon if you want to get notified of these videos. I've been told the notifications do work. So hit the bell. If you know somebody else who also might enjoy this, or maybe they could use this lecture in, in their life, then share this video with them. I mean, I, I try to share it as much as I can, but help me out here. Otherwise, leave a like on the stream or the video afterwards. Leave, leave your comments down below, and I will see you... Well, tomorrow for the, uh, the, the Sunday stream, we're still working on a Starjammer module. Or I'll see you next Saturday for something else. I haven't decided yet. I hope to see you all next time. Take care.